Kandyan Kingdom falling into the hands of the British Empire and deposing of King Sri Wikrama Rajasinghe started the history of British Ceylon it ended over 2,300 years of Sinhalese monarchy rule on the island. The British rule on the island lasted until 1948 when the country gained independence. Background Portuguese presence The first Europeans to visit Ceylon in modern times were the Portuguese. Lourenco de Almeida arrived in 1505, finding the island divided into seven warring kingdoms and unable to fend off intruders. The Portuguese founded a fort at the port city of Colombo in 1517 and gradually extended their control over the coastal areas. In 1592 the Sinhalese moved their capital to the inland city of Kandy, a location more secure against attack from invaders. Intermittent warfare continued through the 16th century. Many lowland the Salinese were forced to convert to Christianity while the coastal Moors were religiously persecuted and forced to retreat to the central highlands while some of them desired to leave the country. The Buddhist majority disliked Portuguese occupation and its influences and welcomed any power who might rescue them and defeat the Portuguese. In 1602, therefore, when the Dutch captain Joris van Spilbergen landed, the King of Kandy appealed to him for help. <laughs> Dutch presence It was in 1669 that the Dutch attacked in earnest but ended with an agreement which was disrespected by both parties, and not until 1656 that Colombo fell. By 1660 the Dutch controlled the whole island except the Kingdom of Kandy. The Dutch, who were Protestants, persecuted the Catholics the left over Portuguese settlers but left the Buddhists, Hindus and Muslims alone. However, they taxed the people far more heavily than the Portuguese had done. A mixed Dutch Sri Lankan people known as Burger peoples are the legacy of Dutch rule. In 1669, the British sea captain Robert Knox landed by chance on Ceylon and was captured by the King of Kandy. He escaped 19 years later and wrote an account of his stay. This helped to bring the island to the attention of the British. <laughs> <laughs> British rule During the Napoleonic Wars, Great Britain, fearing that French control of the Netherlands might deliver Ceylon to the French, occupied the coastal areas of the island with little difficulty in 1796. In 1802 by the Treaty of Amiens the Dutch part of the island was ceded to Britain, and became a crown colony. In 1803 the British invaded the Kingdom of Kandy in the First Kandyan War, but were bloodily repulsed. In 1815 Kandy was occupied in the Second Kandyan War, ending Ceylonese independence. Following the bloody suppression of the Uva Rebellion, the Kandyan peasantry were stripped of their lands by the Wastelands Ordinance, a modern enclosure movement and reduced to penury. The British found that the uplands of Sri Lanka were very suited to coffee, tea and rubber cultivation, and by the mid-19th century Ceylon tea had become a staple of the British market, bringing great wealth to a small class of white tea planters. To work the estates, the planters imported large numbers of Tamil workers as indentured labourers from South India, who soon made up 10% of the island's population. These workers had to work in slave-like conditions and to live in line rooms, not very different from cattle sheds. The British colonialists favoured the semi-European burghers, certain high-caste Sinhalese and the Tamils who were mainly concentrated to the north of the country, exacerbating divisions and enmities which have survived ever since. Nevertheless, the British also introduced democratic elements to Sri Lanka for the first time in its history. The burghers were given some degree of self-government as early as 1833. It was not until 1909 that constitutional development began with a partly elected assembly, and not until 1920 that elected members outnumbered official appointees. Universal suffrage was introduced in 1931, over the protests of the Sinhalese, Tamil and Berger elite who objected to the common people being allowed to vote. Independence movement The Ceylon National Congress was founded to agitate for greater autonomy. The party soon split along ethnic and caste lines. Professor. 
K. M. De Silva, the famous Paradenia historian has pointed out that the refusal of the Ceylon Tamils to accept minority status to be one of the main causes which broke up the CNC. The CNC did not seek independence or Swaraj. What may be called the independence movement broke into two streams, viz., the constitutionalists, who sought independence by gradual modification of the status of Ceylon, and the more radical groups associated with the Colombo Youth League, Labour Movement of Gunasingh, and the Jaffna Youth Congress. These organizations were the first to raise the cry of Swaraj, or outright independence, following the Indian example, when Jawaharlal Nehru, Sarojini Naidu and other Indian leaders visited Ceylon in 1926. The efforts of the constitutionalists led to the arrival of the Donamore Commission Reforms 1931 and the Solbury Commission Recommendations, which essentially upheld the 1944 draft constitution of the Board of Ministers headed by D.S. Sananayaki. The Marxist Lanka Sama Samaja Party LSSP, which grew out of the youth leagues in 1935, made the demand for outright independence a cornerstone of their policy. Its deputies in the State Council, N.M. Pereira and Philip Gunnar Wardena, were aided in this struggle by Colvin R. De Silva, Leslie Gunuardina, Vivian Gunuardina, Edmund Samarkadi and K. Natessa Iyer. They also demanded the replacement of English as the official language by Sinhala and Tamil. The Marxist groups were a tiny minority and yet their movement was viewed with grave suspicion by the British administration. The heroic but ineptive attempts to rouse the public against the British Raj in revolt would have led to certain bloodshed and a delay in independence. British state papers released in the 1950s show that the Marxist movement had a very negative impact on the policy makers at the colonial office. The Solbury Commission was the most important result of the agitation for constitutional reform in the 1930s. The Tamil leadership had by then fallen into the hands of G. G. Panambalam who had rejected the Salinese identity. Panambalam had declared himself a proud Dravidian and attempted to establish an independent identity for the Tamils. Panamblam was a politician who attacked the Sinhalese, and their historical chronicle known as the Mahavamsa. One such inflamed attack in Navalapitiya led to the first Sinhala Tamil riot in 1939. Panambalam opposed universal franchise, supported the caste system, and claimed that the protection of Tamil rights requires the Tamils 45% of the population in 1931 having an equal number of seats in parliament to that of the Sinhalese about 72% of the population. This 50 to 50 or balanced representation policy became the hallmark of Tamil politics of the time. Panambalam also accused the British of having established colonization in traditional Tamil areas, and having favoured the Buddhists by the Buddhist Temporalities Act. The Solbury Commission rejected these submissions by Panambalam, and even noted their unacceptable communal character. Sinhalese writers pointed out the large immigration of Tamils to the southern urban centres, especially after the opening of the Jaffna Colombo Railway. Meanwhile, Sananayaki, Baron Jayatilik, Oliver Gunatilik and others lobbied the Solbury Commission without confronting them officially. The unofficial submissions contained what was to later become the draft constitution of 1944, the close collaboration of the D.S. Sananayaki government with the wartime British administration led to the support of Lord Louis Mountbatten. His dispatches and a telegram to the colonial office supporting independence for Ceylon have been cited by historians as having helped the Sananayaki government to secure the independence of Sri Lanka. The shrewd cooperation with the British as well as diverting the needs of the war market to Ceylonese markets as a supply point, managed by Oliver Gunatalik, also led to a very favourable fiscal situation for the newly independent government. <laughs> Second World War During World War II, Sri Lanka was a frontline British base against the Japanese. Opposition to the war in Sri Lanka was orchestrated by Marxist organizations. The leaders of the LSSP pro-independence agitation were arrested by the colonial authorities. On 5 April 1942, the Japanese Navy bombed Colombo, which led to the flight of Indian merchants, dominant in the Colombo commercial sector. This flight removed a major political problem facing the Sananayaki government. Marxist leaders also escaped, to India, where they participated in the independence struggle there. The movement in Ceylon was minuscule, limited to the English-educated intelligentsia and trade unions, mainly in the urban centres. 
These groups were led by Robert Gunnar Wardena, Philip's brother. In stark contrast to this, heroic but ineffective approach to the war, the Sananayaki government took advantage of the war to further its rapport with the commanding elite. Ceylon became crucial to the British Empire in the war, with Lord Louis Mountbatten using Colombo as his headquarters for the Eastern Theatre. Oliver Gunadaleka successfully exploited the markets for the country's rubber and other agricultural products to replenish the treasury. Nonetheless, Sinhalese continued to agitate for independence and Sinhalese sovereignty, using the opportunities offered by the war to establish a special relationship with Britain. Meanwhile, the Marxists, identifying the war as an imperialist sideshow and desiring a proletarian revolution, chose a path of agitation disproportionate to their negligible combat strength, and diametrically opposed to the «constitutionalist» approach of Sananayaki and other ethnic Sinhalese leaders. A small garrison on the Cocos Islands, manned by Salinese, attempted to expel the British. It has been claimed that the LSSP had some hand in the action, though this is far from clear. Three of the participants were the only British subject peoples to be shot for mutiny during World War II. Sri Lankans in Singapore and Malaysia formed the Lanka Regiment of the Indian National Army. The constitutionalists, led by D. S. Sananayaki, succeeded in winning independence. The Solbury Constitution was essentially what Sananayaki's Board of Ministers had drafted in 1944. The promise of dominion status, and independence itself, had been given by the colonial office. <laughs> Post-war The Sinhalese leader Don Stephen Sananayaki left the CNC on the issue of independence, disagreeing with the revised aim of the achieving of freedom, although his real reasons were more subtle. He subsequently formed the United National Party in 1946, when a new constitution was agreed on, based on the behind-the-curtain lobbying of the Solbury Commission. At the elections of 1947, the UNP won a minority of the seats in Parliament, but cobbled together a coalition with the Sinhala Maha Sabha of Solomon Bandaranaika and the Tamil Congress of G.G. Panambalam. The successful inclusions of the Tamil communalist leader Panambalam, and his Sinhala counterpart Bandaranaika were a remarkable political balancing act by Sananayaki. However, the vacuum in Tamil nationalist politics created by Panamblam's transition to a moderate opened the field for the Tamil Arasu Kachchi, a Tamil sovereignist party rendered into English as the federal party led by S. J. V. Chelvanikam, the lawyer son of a Christian minister. See also History of Sri Lanka <laughs>